in a world that we'll talk about today quite a bit, which is the digital world, I think the most fascinating philosophically and technically definition of life is life in the digital world. Mm -hmm. So chatbots, essentially creatures, whether they're replicas of humans or totally independent creations, perhaps in an automatic way, I think there's going to be chatbots that we would ethically be troubled by if we wanted to kill them. They would have the capacity to suffer, they would be very unhappy with you trying to sh turn them off, hmm. and then there will be large groups of activists that will protest, and they'll go to the Supreme Court, of whatever the Supreme Court looks like in, t in uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they will uh, demand that these chatbots would have the same rights as us humans. Do you think that's possible? I saw that Google engineer who was basically saying this had already happened, and I, I, uh, I was surprised by it uh, because it just I, when I looked at the chat logs of it, it didn't seem particularly interesting. On the other hand, I can definitely see. It. I mean, GPT three for people who you know haven't paid attention shows that serious step ups are possible, and obviously, you know, you, know, you you've talked about AI in your podcast a ton. Um, is it possible that GPT-9 or something is is kind of like that? Or GPT-15 or, or GPT-4, maybe? But... Yeah, for people just listening, there's a deep skepticism in your face. Yeah, you know, the reason being because, um, it, you know, it's possible. It's possible that you have like a partition of society on literally this basis. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's one model where there's some people, just like there's vegetarians and non-vegetarians, right? There may be um, machines have life and machines are machines, you know, like, or something like that, right? Uh, you know, you could, you could definitely imagine some kind of partition like that in the future where your fundamental political social system, that's a foundational assumption. And, you know, is AI does it you know deserve the same rights as like a human or for example a corporation is an intermediate uh do you see that thing which is how human is, are different corporations have you seen that infographic <laughs> it's actually funny yeah, so it's there's like a spectrum. there's a spectrum so for example disney is considered about as human as like a dog but like exxon i, I may be remembering this wrong but they had like a level with like human at one end yeah. and like rock at the other does it have to do with corporate structure what what what's i think it's the, about people's empathy for that corporation their brand oh. identity but it's interesting to see that, first of all, people sort of do think of corporations as being more or less, like the branding yeah. is really what they're responding well, to. Well, that's right? what, I mean, they're also responding, you know, I have a brand of human that I'm trying to sell mm -hmm. and it seems to be effective for the most part. <laughs> sure. Although it has become like a running joke that I might be a robot. Right. Which means there's the brand is cracking. <laughs> Could be. It's, it's seeping through. But I mean, in that sense, I just, I think, uh, I don't see a reason why chatbots can't manufacture the brand of being human, of being sentient. I mean, that is the Turing test, but it's like the multiplayer Turing test. Now that actually a fair number of chatbots have passed the Turing test, I'd say there's at least two steps up, right? Mm -hmm. One is um, a multiplayer Turing test where you have chatbots talking to each other. And then you ask, can you determine the difference between N chatbots talking to each other and clicking buttons and stuff in apps and N humans doing that? And I think we're very far off, or I shouldn't say very far off, at least, I don't know how far off we are in terms of time, but we're still far off in terms of a group of N chatbots looking like their digital output is like the group of N humans, like a go from the Turing test to the multiplayer Turing test. That's one definition. Another definition is, you know, to be able to kind of swap in and you're not just convincing one human that this is a human for a small you know session you're convincing all humans that this is a human for n sessions remote work actually makes this possible right that's another definition of, of a multiplayer turing test where basically you have a chatbot that's fully automated that is earning money for you as an intelligent agent on a computer that's able to go and get remote work jobs and so on. I would consider that next level, right? Mm -hmm. If you could have something that was like that, that was competent enough to, I mean, because everything on a computer can be automated, right? Literally, you could be totally hands-free, just like autonomous driving, you could have autonomous earning. As a challenge problem, 
if you were Microsoft or Apple and you had legitimate access to the operating system, just like Apple says, can you send me details of this event? A decentralized thing could, in theory, log you know, the actions of 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people. And with cryptocurrency, you could even monitor a wallet that was on that computer. And you could see you know, what long run series of actions were increasing or decreasing this digital balance. You see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? So you start to get, at least conceptually, it'd be invasive and, and you know, there'd be a privacy issue and so on. Conceptually, you could imagine an agent that could learn what actions humans were doing that resulted in the increase of their local cryptocurrency balance, okay? Mm -hmm. there, there may be better ways to formulate it, but that I would consider a challenge problem is to go from the Turing test to a genuine intelligent agent that can actually go and make money for you. If you can do that, that's a big deal. People oh. obviously have trading bots and stuff, but that would be you know the next level. It's typing out emails, it's creating documents. It's actually so mimic human behavior in its entirety. Yeah, that's right. And it can it'll schedule Zooms, it'll send emails, it'll essentially, because if you think about it, a human is hitting the keys and clicking the mouse, but just like a self-driving car, the wheel rotates by itself, right? Those keys are effectively just, it's like a, like the automator app in, in Apple, right? Um, everything's just moving on the screen. You're seeing it there and it's just an AI. It's kind of hilarious that the I'm not a robot click thing mm -hmm. actually works. Because I, I actually don't know how, how, that's happening. how it works, but I think it has to do with the movement of the mouse, yes. the timing, and they know that it's very difficult for currently for a bot to mimic human behavior in the way they would click that little checkbox. Yeah, exactly. I think it's something, I mean, uh, again, my recollection on that is it's like a pile of highly obfuscated JavaScript with all kinds, it looks like a very simple box, but it's doing a lot of stuff and it's collecting all kinds of instrumentation. And yeah, exactly. Like a like a robot is just a little too deterministic, or if it's got noise, it's like Gaussian noise. And the way humans do it is just not something that you'd usually be able to do without collecting thousands and thousands and thousands of human traces doing it. But well, it is a predator prey on that. Go ahead. Well, and then the computer- Or millions of human traces, I don't know. The computer just sees the JavaScript. It needs to be able to look outside the simulation for the computer, the world is, like you, right. it doesn't, the computer doesn't know about the right. physical world. So yes. it has to look outside of its world and introspect back on this simple box. Right. It's, which is kind of, you know, I think that's exactly what mushrooms do or like psychedelics is you get to go outside and look back in. And yeah, that's what a computer needs to do. I, you know, I do wonder whether they actually give people insight or whether they give people the illusion of insight. Um, is there a difference? Yeah, because, uh, well, actual insight, you know, actual insight is, Again, Maxwell's equations. You're, you're able to shift the world with that. There's a lot of practical devices that work. The illusion of insight is I'm Jesus Christ and nothing happens, right? So I don't know. I think those are quite different. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I think you can fake it till you make it on that one, which is um, insight in some sense is revealing a truth that was there all along. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess like I'm talking about technical insight where you you have, this is the thing, you know, we were talking about actually before the podcast, like technical truths versus political truths, right? Some truths, they're, they're on a spectrum. And there's some truths that are actually entirely political in the sense that if you can change the software in enough people's heads, you change the, the value of the truth. For example, the location of a border is effectively consensus between large enough groups of people uh, who is the CEO that's, you know, consensus among a certain group of people what is the value of a currency or any stock, right? That that market price is just the psychology of a bunch of people. Like literally, if you can change enough people's minds, you can change the value of the border or the position in the hierarchy or the value of the currency. Those are purely political truths. Then all the way on the other end are technical truths that exist independent of whatever any one human or all humans think, like uh, the gravitational constant, right? Or the diameter of a virus. Those, those are just those exist independent of the human mind. Change enough human minds doesn't matter. Those, those remain constant. And um, then you have things that are interestingly in the middle where cryptocurrency has tried to pull more and more things from the domain of political truths into technical truths where they say, okay, the one social convention we have is um, that if you hold this amount of Bitcoin or, or that if you hold this private key, you hold this Bitcoin. And then we make that very hard to change because you have to change a lot of technical truths. So you, you can push things to this interesting intermediate zone. Yeah, the question is how 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 much of our world can we push into that 